Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello, creatives. I'm Joanna Penn, and today is episode 449 of the podcast, and it's Saturday 7th of September 2019 as I record this. So today I'm talking about performance tips and audiobook narration with Sean Pratt, who has narrated over a thousand audiobooks, and also he's been an actor and a voice coach, and we talk a lot about tips for when you read your book aloud or your stories aloud or your nonfiction aloud or whatever. And this is super useful because if you are going to be a successful author, you are going to have to read your work aloud. This is just something that you have to do, either at a a launch event or a literary festival or any kind of um, any kind of event. You might have to read your work aloud or as happened to me this week on a podcast. So I was doing uh, the the interview will be coming out soon on Character Test, Character Test podcast by Joe Bunting. great interview but then uh, he kind of sprung on me that he wanted me to read uh, two separate passages from Valley of Dry Bones. Now I did not narrate Valley of Dry Bones, Um, my usual uh, arcane narrator uh, Veronica Jaguer did that. So I was like oh okay and I was so glad that I have had some voice training and that I've become more confident with narration because in the past I might well have said no. (laughs) But it worked really well because he had some very perceptive questions about the pieces that I read. Uh, So, but it made me think about this interview with Sean in that it is not just audiobook narration. And I know that very few of you listening will narrate your own audiobooks. I know it's a commitment, but many of you will have to read your work aloud in other settings. So I want you to think about that today. The tips are not... Uh, just for audiobook narration, they are for performing your work in any uh, situation. So that is coming up. So not much in publishing or book marketing or futurist stuff this week, so straight into my personal update. So... (laughs) It, the the chickens have come home to roost or, or however you say it because basically last week my personal update was I did a whole load of publishing tasks and it involved a lot of clicking and uh, so I did a lot of clicking and I also did editing for productivity for authors and I did a 12 hour day on one of the days and I did not look after myself properly and then I went to the gym and did some uh, weight training and essentially essentially screwed up um, or overstrained, let's say overstrained my right shoulder and I am right handed. And so I've spent nearly four days in quite acute pain (laughs) and uh, have not been able to work. And I wanted to mention this because I am, I'm slightly embarrassed about it as people always say, you know, oh, well, you wrote the healthy author, you should know what you're doing. But I should say I co-wrote the healthy author, (laughs) sorry, the healthy writer with, um, Uh, Dr. Ewan Lawson. So, and often we write the books we need to learn about ourselves. So I wrote uh, The Successful Author Mindset when I was going through a lot of self-doubt, comparisonitis, uh, all the things that we go through as authors. And it doesn't stop me feeling those things it, but it acknowledges that these things exist and hopefully help other people. So the healthy, the healthy writer, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm not meant to work 12 hours straight without standing up and stretching. And I'm not meant to, uh, you know, I'm meant to dictate more. And it's funny because I dictate in batches and uh, I do a lot of dictation at different times, but I don't do it consistently all the time in order to reduce my mouse work, for example, or my typing. So (laughs) 
<laughs> this in the last few days I've got much more back into dictation uh, I have been using dictation within Gmail um, which has been interesting and then using my left hand to do things uh, I mean it's even been a challenge with getting dressed in the morning and uh, all those personal hygiene things that you know even I have you know sort of shoulder length hair and putting my hair up in a ponytail is just impossible <laughs> my husband who is bald uh, has has not been much of a help to be honest with my hair <laughs> the problems of uh, shoulder injury um, but it's very much brought home to me um, what we need to be careful about and so I and I wanted to mention it to to you guys because if you do have and I had the niggly pain last week I had it I felt it and I just carried on and that was not good I was not looking after myself I was focusing I had a deadline which was to deliver a book to uh, deliver <laughs> ironically productivity for authors which had a chapter on health in terms of productivity in that you have to be healthy in order to be productive and then I end up like this so I can get so deep into my work but I have a very long concentration span I can sit down for hours and not look up even, um, which does result in physical pain, <laughs> physical issues. And that is not healthy. So I'm laughing because I'm, I'm just, I am not, I'm just telling you, I am imperfect. We are all imperfect. We are all a work in progress. But, um, you know, as I head towards 45 next year and I realized that some of these niggly pains they build up and they build up and then suddenly they go from niggly to quite acute so if you're in this situation whatever it is it might not be your shoulder it might be whatever else it is um, please pay attention to it and try and work on it before you um, sort of fall over the edge uh, and I'm very very aware that this it kind of has been on and off for a while now and I have tried several things to deal with it I've tried physio um, so now I'm going to see a specialist because that's what one should do so yeah I just wanted to mention that um, and again the healthy writer I need to revisit that myself and change things up so I did go and buy an Apple watch I have not worn a watch for 10 years I but what I need is something to kick me out of um to kick me out of flow probably which is difficult because you know maybe that's a place where I do good work but I'm not doing well for my health so um and I have tried timers on my computer and I just ignore them so what happens with the watch is it will vibrate and it will make me uh, become aware of what's going on so yeah I just wanted to mention that and encourage you if you have any niggly physical pains to really think about your physical situation and uh, take action on that so uh, this week I am off to Lisbon in Portugal for a book research trip for my next arcane thriller. Um, you may remember I went to Amsterdam earlier this year and in Amsterdam discovered the Portuguese synagogue. So and that has led to me reading books about the Portuguese empire. And I know in my last uh, arcane thriller, Valley of Dry Bones, I did the Spanish empire. <laughs> so... The Portuguese Empire is also fascinating and uh, really looking at how empires rise and fall and what they leave behind, which uh, is a good thing to remember in our changing world. So I am looking forward to a few days away and obviously we'll be away from the computer, which will probably do me good. I will be sharing pictures uh, as ever on Instagram at jfpenauthor. Thanks as ever for all your emails and tweets and comments. Lots of you enjoyed the discussion with Lisa Lilly last week. Uh, Amanda said, I love seeing a more positive spin on writing and working a second job. I had to get a day job a few years ago because my writing wasn't paying well enough. I'm working like a maniac to get back out there and do it right this time because really the only thing I've ever wanted to do was write. Still, the optimism in this interview really got me. And Jason, <laughs> again, 
and I'm just picking up all these things about pain. Jason said, nice tips on dealing with pain in the discussion with Lisa. We talked about that last week. Um, Jason says, my back and neck act up sometimes. Even now I'm lying down in order to tend to your podcast. Stretching helps a great deal and going for walks. Yes, I do both of those things. (laughs) Luckily, some of my best ideas come to mind while walking in nature. The solitude also grants me the freedom to recite poetry aloud. It's also very calming, if stressed, to feel the wind move through the trees. That's lovely, Jason, to think of you reciting poetry while walking uh, amongst the trees. Uh, Lovely image. Thank you for that. Uh, Jean McCarthy says, uh, listening to the creative pen while walking my little schnoodle has become a daily habit for this healthy writer and sent a very cute picture of her dog with some sunflowers. Thank you, Jean. And uh, yes, healthy writer tips. (laughs) Very useful. So today's show is sponsored by my own audiobooks for authors. If you love audio, and I assume you do because you're listening to this show, uh, you can check out uh, audiobooks by Joanna Penn. So first of all, you can get The Healthy Writer in audiobook. And actually, it's quite cool because we have two narrators, um, uh, my usual narrator for me, my voice, and um, a male narrator who is also called Joe Penn, which is funny, um, who did the male voice for Ewan. So um, you can get The Healthy Writer in audio if you uh, and I shall be listening to that myself (laughs) revisiting that. Also Successful self-publishing. I narrated that. The ebook is free, so um, if you are listening on Audible, you can always get the free ebook and then get the super super cheap audio book. If you struggle with the roller coaster of being a writer, self-doubt, comparisonitis, and more, check out the successful author mindset. Uh, if you want more on business, check out how to make a living with your writing or how to market a book, the third edition, uh, plus how to write non-fiction and business for authors. All available in audio and more coming soon. Just go to your favourite audiobook store and search for Joanna Penn. You can also request them at the library. Now, not every single book is available on every single store, but I'm working on it, believe me. (laughs) With more coming soon. For links and samples, go to thecreativepen.com forward slash audio. So this type of sponsorship pays for the hosting transcription and editing but my time in creating the show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons and thanks to everyone supporting the show on patreon thanks to new patrons this week anna joy overstreet peter furco s rose Henry Stradford and Helen Martin and thanks to everyone who's been supporting the show for months and years I really really appreciate your support on Patreon like the tweets and emails it demonstrates you enjoy the show and want it to continue and you can support the show with just a couple of dollars a month and you can get the extra monthly Q&A audio coming up soon for September and there are several years worth of backlist Q&A so lots lots more audio fun if you would like it. You can support the show at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Sean Pratt has been a professional actor in theatre, film, TV and voiceovers for 30 years and has narrated over 1,000 audiobooks. He's also the author of To Be or Wanna Be, the top 10 differences between a successful actor and a starving artist. Welcome, Sean. Well, uh, thank you very much for having me. Oh, very excited to be here. Oh, it's great to have you on the show. So first up, tell us a bit more about you and your journey into writing and audiobook narration. Well, um, the let's start with the audiobooks. Um, so I, I I grew up as an actor. I've uh, been an actor my entire life, actually. I started acting when I was 10 in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, where I'm from, and uh, went off to college. I got my acting degree, went off to New York to become a classical theater actor. And um, along the way, uh, sort of ran into audiobooks around, I'd say, around 1994, I met a, an actor who did them professionally uh, when he wasn't doing theater, and one thing led to another. And by 1996, I had started narrating, and uh, very quickly 
after that, almost went full time immediately. And that was, what, 22, 23 years ago and 1,000 books. And um, I've loved it ever since. And as far as the audiobooks in the industry, I started out narrating fiction like most uh, narrators do. But after a while, um, I began to ask for more and more nonfiction. Uh, though I enjoy performing fiction uh, as a reader, um, just a, a, my own personal uh, predilection, I like to read nonfiction. I like to learn something all the time. And that's one of the key draws to nonfiction for me as a performer. That and the fact that nonfiction narration, for my money, is more difficult to do as a performer. It's more difficult to make it entertaining, which is one of the key things I teach my students. Because now, on top of narrating audiobooks, I, um, I teach um, audiobook narration technique – uh, from nonfiction as a basis uh, to narrators and authors um, pretty much around the, around the globe. I have students all over the, all over the, the world practically. Um, as a writer, um, I started teaching classes on the business of show business very soon after I graduated from college. When I got out of school and got to New York, I realized there was this tremendous amount of information that no one had taught me in school. And frankly, I was – a little put off by that, and I, be, I made up my business to, to learn the business of show business. And then I turned around and began to teach it at colleges and universities, doing workshops with actor groups around the country, and writing articles online. And out of that, I kept getting asked, you know, do you have any materials you can send us or show us or give us? And uh, it's it sort of um, uh, the seed was planted, the fire in the belly was planted to write some kind of book on getting into show business and from my perspective as a performer and I wanted my particular angle as a writer on this particular topic to be the fact that it's not talent that is the ultimate arbiter of your success it's talent and type and tenacity and uh, in fact in my book to be or want to be I do not talk about talent as one of the top 10 differences I don't believe it is and so that was the driving force behind sitting down and working my way through and writing my book. Mm. Wow, that's really cool. And I feel like we have a lot in common then, because when I came into writing sort of back in 2006, 2007, I was like, I came from a business background. And I was like, where's the information on business for authors? So I ended up writing a book called Business for Authors. But it's so right. funny, because like you, the kind of the craft side is full of resources. And then the business side, the actual making a living uh, there, there wasn't much. So that's really interesting. But I want to ask you, 22 years audiobook narration, what, what are the big changes? Like, what's the biggest shift you've seen between when you got started and, and now? Well, the, the, seminal, the seminal moment came with downloadable audiobooks. <clears throat> because before then, uh, when I first started back in the Stone Age, it feels like, we recorded on tape and the books were put out on cassettes. And, um, you know, and then they transitioned into CDs, but that's still a physical medium. You had to have them in your car. You couldn't scratch them, you know, put them in one at a time. But when the when downloadable audiobooks began to happen in the, uh, what, the early 2000s, I'm guessing, if I can get my dates right, that was the moment that technology caught up with demand and it just lit a fire under everything. And the number of books that have been produced – on a yearly basis since then has been growing on a geometric curve um, to the point that I think last year, I'm going to ballpark this number, something around the, the number of like 55 to 60,000 audiobooks were created just for the U.S. market, not counting the U.K. market. And um, it's a $3 billion uh, industry now domestically in the United States. So it was that piece of it that you could put it on your phone or in your car, on your iPad, or on your, you know, on your i whatever device you have, and you know, go for a walk, go to the gym, go for a drive. That accessibility changed everything. Mm. Yeah, and it's fascinating. I think it was around 2007 when the iPhone okay. came came out, but that was obviously there was streaming audio before that. But I remember yeah. um, 2007 certainly. I was still downloading MP3s, syncing them to my device with a cable. Then in my car, I would put a cassette in the cassette deck with a little <laughs> adapter to my iPod. <laughs> Do right. you remember that? 
<laughs> but it felt like magic, didn't it? Didn't it feel oh, like magic? Oh, goodness. And then, of course, once you got the phone, that became, that changed things. And around 2014, that's when really the, well, but certainly as a podcaster, podcasting really started to take off in 2014, which is when I think downloadable audio on your phone became sort of mass market. So, yeah, I mean, that's it. We're kind of at the beginning, really, aren't we? When you think about yeah. how long tapes were around or um, people listening to stories. I mean, this this is quite a new industry. Absolutely. The, the, when I started in 96, the rocket was uh, at the launch pad getting ready to take off because there was a groundswell. You know, they were shifting from cassettes, which only held, you know, 90 minutes of material to these CDs, which were, you know, smaller. They could be the, the packaging got smaller. That, that was a key. And um, and also the demand was was beginning to really grow up until, you know, the early 90s. Audiobooks, as a general statement, audiobooks were more of a marketing gimmick than they were what they've become now, which is a real resource for people with lots of different needs, whether it's educational needs, learning needs, um, uh, or just you know entertainment. Before around 1990, the publishers viewed audiobooks in the main as a marketing gimmick. You, so you would mm-hmm. have you would, they would hire a Hollywood actor, say like a Meryl Streep or somebody to read a, a you know, a, a show, a, you know, a two hour or four hour version of a 12 hour book and the, to promote the book itself, you know, like the latest, you know, I don't know, uh, Tom Clancy or, or, you know, romance novel or whatever, you name it. But then the, the groundswell began to happen. The demand was really starting to take off. And so I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And, um, and so suddenly my, my, my very first clients were books on tape and Blackstone audio. And, uh, you know, now of course the industry has changed fundamentally. There's far more audio publishers. The volume has increased exponentially. The genres they're willing to invest money in have diversified. So it's really, it's, it's just exploded from that point on. Mm. Well, a couple of things after that. First of all, Meryl Streep reading Tom Clancy is, is well, a good... <laughs> okay, that was, that was a poor, for example, for example, I was trying... There was a book she mar- she narrated that I, it was like a romance novel or something, and I couldn't think of it at the moment. I was so, going to uh, say no. I think that would be great. I mean, she's an actress but, after all, actor, yeah. so she could do whatever yeah. she likes. But but uh, also, I did want to ask you. Um, so I I feel like my own behaviour has changed over the last couple of years in that I now read, and I believe it is reading. It's just a brain interface, right? Um, mm-hmm. I, I mainly read nonfiction in audio, and I read it on one point five and sometimes even two x speed. Mm-hmm. And I wondered like what your thoughts were as a narrator, because obviously speed changes the your performance. What you yeah. did is not what hits my brain. So what do you think about that with um, nonfiction in particular? Well, you have two issues at play here. First, you, it depends on what the listener wants to get out of the material. If they just want the information... So, you know, like the top 10 investment strategies for 2019 or whatever, then perhaps they want to crank it up to 1.5 or 2 just to get the information. OK, they're not really mm, concerned about. Yeah, quote that's mainly what I do with nonfiction. Yeah, right. But then you have other kinds of nonfiction, whether it might be a self-help book or a memoir or a piece of history where you actually want that performance. And um so then you'll have people who will go ahead and listen to it at tempo or slightly faster. Um, one of the my biggest um, uh, one of the things that I, I harp on with my students' performances all the time is this issue of tempo. Is that they there a lot of people a lot of narrators operate under this misguided idea that if they go a little too fast they're going to lose the listener. And I disagree. I mean, I mean listen to you and I talking back and forth. We're both, you know, really animated and into what we're talking about. And the listeners will be able to follow every nuance of what we're saying. We don't have to slow down and say everything at a sort of a moderate tempo and put them to sleep and that's one of the reasons why they turn it up to get the speed mm. you know I, I don't blame the listen you know there's coming from a theater background I you know I was we were it was beaten into us quite literally that tempo is everything and if you don't pick up the pace of the scene and the audience lo- you lose the audience that's your fault as the performer for not driving the scene with energy and verb and the idea of being you know enthusiastic and ent- engaging and entertaining that's the, that's on the performer so i i i don't have any problems with a you know if someone wants to turn the speed up because they don't feel they're being 
entertained they want it coming in faster that's their call that's mm. the that's the fault of the narration in my opinion so um so you mentioned performance there the word performance and you have in um in i don't know what was one of your book or your website you have it's mm. not reading it's a performance and that to me is something that i learned from you know all people like yourself about performance and narration and a lot of authors and writers are petrified of this that you know they might be asked at a literary festival to read from their book or um whether they're narrating for actual uh, production value but even if it's just at a launch or something what are your tips for authors around reading their own material do you mean live or, or when they want well, to Well, kind of, I think, let's say live, because a lot of people, right. um, probably, possibly more people listening will read live than will read for audiobook narration. Um, I know this may sound, count, no, well, it's not counterintuitive. They, they would do well, in all seriousness, to either take a public speaking class or an improv acting class, something to get them on their feet and to start to perform. The, I, the challenge is for a lot of writers, the writers that I know, they tend to be introverts. So the notion of getting up in front of people to begin with is terrifying. Um, so getting on your feet and taking a public speaking course or classes, you know, like uh, Toastmasters in the United States, or even something like a, uh, an improvisational acting class um, will get them on their feet, will get them used to expressing themselves and feeling safe doing it. I think that's the first step is if if you're just terrified of standing up in front of people to begin with, you're not going to be able to access your emotions uh, to be, to to then perform them for the, the piece. Um, the um, well, that's those, that's the first piece of advice. So uh, then um, the next step would be working with a coach. If they're you know if you're going on a book launch, this is really important to your career. And don't think don't think that you standing in front of your in your living room or in front of your you know your spouse or your partner reading aloud is going to cut it. There is a certain panache to doing this. There's a certain flair, and I'm sure you've been to many readings where uh, the, the one that sticks in my mind was uh, years ago. I want to say 1992. My first wife Karen, who was an aspiring writer, took me to a a series of readings in uh, Central Park that uh, during that summer and. Um, there were like four authors who were getting up to read their material. And the first three were just terrible. They were rather too frightened. They hadn't prepared. Uh, they thought they could get through by mumbling their way. And then the fourth writer who came out that evening was the star of the evening. It was Tom Robbins, the writer of Skinny Legs and All and Jitterbug Perfume, the, mm, these yeah. wonderful pieces of fiction. And out steps this courtly Southern gentleman. And he had presence and he had, he had style. And he had obviously practiced that piece with someone. I mean, he knew how to perform it. And it is a performance. The, the writing, a, writing a piece of material and performing it are mutually exclusive skills. They do not translate to each other. And unfortunately, for many authors, part of their selling process of sell, marketing their product, they have to become a performer. So really, that, that those basic ideas, you, they need to be thinking – how I need to become a performer now on a very basic level. It's so, like I said, it starts with public speaking, perhaps getting up in an improv class, working with a coach, and then finally practicing recording themselves, not only on audio, but videotaping themselves. How are they coming across to the viewer, the people in that bookstore or at that convention or wherever? Are, do, are there, is their head straight down in the material? Are they mumbling? What is their body posture like? You know, all those things communicate something to the audience. And there is nothing worse, and I'm sure you've experienced this as an audience member, where all you're doing while the person is reading is going, oh, God, I feel so sorry for that person. Please don't fall apart. Please don't start crying because I'm going to get really embarrassed if you start crying. And <laughs> Right. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just I'm laughing because this is why I, I think this is so important. Like you said, this is important to your career. I so agree. And I just yeah. don't know why publishers and things persist in asking authors to read. Like a QA and a is usually fine because the author yeah. knows their stuff. They just reading is just, as you say, it's a completely different skill. And the words that sa they sound a certain way in your own head, the minute mm -hmm. you try and read them out loud, it's, it seems completely different. It's, it's so well, weird. One of one of the but one of the biggest issues that I run into when I'm I, I, one of the things that I do is 
I coach authors who have made a decision that they are going to narrate their own material, uh, nonfiction. Okay. Mm. So, uh, and, and usually it's for, because they, you know, and because they are their persona, you know, they tend to be like entrepreneurs of some kind or thought leaders in their industry. And they are, it's like a, like a, like Malcolm Gladwell narrates his own material. He is Malcolm Gladwell. He's part and parcel of what he writes and what he presents. So it makes sense for him to narrate his own material. And or Neil deGrasse Tyson, the physicist, and so or, on. Or me. Uh, or you, yes, absolutely, <laughs> yes. So, so, um, so the, the, but the problem that a lot of authors I run into is they've made um, – beginning authors, they can fall into a trap, and especially in nonfiction, if they're not careful. If they don't have a public speaking background, it's been my experience that the author has – they've been writing the way they think and not the way they speak, which is one more barrier they've thrown up into the challenge of turning it into an audiobook. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, so it's really prevalent. If you go back and look at old nonfiction writing, say, prior to, say, 1920, 1930, uh, when that was the prevalent mode of nonfiction writing was this kind of very professorial presentational style. And it's still around, but not nearly as much as it used to. But I find it a lot with new authors or authors who have never been public speakers or done TED talks or whatever. If you are in the, if you, if you speak about what you do for a living and then put it on paper, the odds are the flow of that piece is going to be so much easier to narrate and to begin with. But if you're writing from a cerebral point of view, from the way you think, you, the, the sentence structure is more complex. The words are longer. There's not really a rhythm to the text itself. And I know a lot of authors read their work aloud, but they're just reading it for comprehension. They're not reading it for flow or for presentation. So that's a really big issue. I mean, it's one of the biggest things I would suggest to the authors who hear this podcast is that – Go back and read it aloud one more time as if you are presenting it, and the areas where they keep stumbling tend to be areas that they've latched together a bunch of very complex words and ideas, whereas if they just rewrote that section in a more conversational way to get the idea across, it'll flow better, and then therefore their reading of it aloud, their performance of it will be better. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's so interesting because mm. this is something I, I think about a lot, which is editing for audio. Because at the moment, I feel like most traditionally published authors um, will, or and editors, let's say editors, will remove commas, for example. So many mm. authors will put in more commas and editors may remove them or put, move them for grammatical reasons. Whereas I feel like now I'm narrating my own work, I'll often re phrase as you say for better speaking rhythm but also put more commas in where I feel like you know that's where I'm either breathing now it yeah. feels like commas should should be for breathing for audio but they're not in a grammatical sense so what are your thoughts on writing for performance the the first thing the the the, um, the ultimate well let's back up so yes I teach my students how to score the text like you need to breathe here and breathe here um, you need to lift this with air quotations we call it marquee in voiceover it's where you take air quotes around an <laughs> a phrase you know it's like so the first time you introduce an idea you put air quotes around it right um, or you underline one or only two words per sentence to hit because one of the traps you can fall into as an author reading your material is you start hitting everything. You start banging away at every single set word in the sentence. Mm. And then, of course, if everything is important, then nothing sounds important. So you have to be judicious about what you want to emphasize. But beyond that, and this is a technique. This gets back into breathing and phrasing, but just skill is ultimately in nonfiction. You don't actually narrate in sentences. You narrate in ideas. So if I'm starting a par, let's say I'm reading a paragraph in a piece, and I launch in, and usually an author will always introduce their new idea at the beginning, first sentence of the paragraph. Here's the thing I want to talk about. And they're going to go through a portion of that idea within a few sentences. I'll drive through those sentences to get finally to the point. Now, that might take one sentence, two, three, or four. But as a narrator, it's a skill you learn over time. You read slightly ahead of what you're narrating so you can see where the where is the author taking me to the point of the idea. I guess the easiest example would be an anecdote. Mm. 
You know, when we start an anecdote, there's always a drive to get to the final button on the anecdote. That's the point of the little story. So when we tell an anecdote, there is a sense of drive. You're not really telling it sentence by sentence. You're going and going and going until you get to the point. And that just takes practice. And they and it's their writing, so they should know where they're going with the idea. So you're right. I mean, punctuation is for the reader's sake, just like things like abbreviations or acronyms. We have to ter- flip that around when we're narrating, so we expand acronyms, we expand abbreviations. But to me, punctuation is nominal. If I sense that the author is driving right into the next sentence, that's where I'm going to go. I'll take a quick breath and launch right into the next sentence because I'm driving to the point of the idea. Mm. No, that is that is really good tip. And, and it's funny because it actually just this morning, I've been re-editing a book for narration. And as you say, I mean, it's my book and I've read it a lot and I wrote it and I should know it. And yet, as you say, <laughs> preparing a book for narration, I feel like people don't realise how much work goes into the prep. You know, they oh. just, they, I mean, I, I hear authors and I understand now, like people are like, oh, it's 200 or $300 or $500 or whatever, perfect finished hour that seems expensive (laughs) so maybe and I'm like well no you don't understand the amount of work so maybe you could just outline like what is the work of a narrator it's not just you rock up and start reading right well so um if uh so I mean like what my preparation is before I do a non-fiction piece yeah like you don't just get handed the book at the studio and start talking oh no 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 (laughs) although although you know after a thousand books I can if I have to and there have been moments when I've had to to take Mm. over a book very quickly but I have a method um I teach my students a method where I go through three steps the first step is when I sort of do a general background on the author what is the topic of the book who is the intended audience some general questions so i'm really thinking like a audio publisher and producer so i do a biographical sketch on the author like i said uh, what the point of the book is the next middle step is research where i sort of put on my director's hat how do you say that phrase in french how do you say this uh, mathematical formula or chemical equation or whatever and um, so you need to know how to pronounce that and that's one of the challenges of being a narrator is we're generalists because we're performers, we read for a living, but every book demands that we become a specialist in that topic to a certain degree, because the more, the easier, the more, the, the more easy uh, the, the, the words and nomenclature and phrases roll off my tongue, the smarter the author sounds to the listener. Mm, yeah. So, so if I'm, you know, if, if I'm doing a book on, on, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, physics or medicine, I have to let those phrases roll off my tongue that are really strange to me, because if I stumble through them, it makes the author sound stupid. I say, you know, so my job is to make them sound smart. So it sounds like the the nomenclature they use just rolls off my tongue. So there's that kind of research. Um, I have to research the acronyms. I I always, you know, I always explain an acronym the first time I use it. I expand all my abbreviations. I look at the different text issues, like do we want to include this this breakout box of you know of uh, additional material, these graphs and charts. So that's a conversation you have with the author or rights holder. Oftentimes, if they're complex illustrations, they're added as a PDF download to the audiobook, mm. which frees me up to say, as you can see from Table 3.6, blah 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 blah. And then they can the, the listener can go to that last track on the audiobook, which is usually the PDF download, and open it up and see the graph. You know, I, I can't explain, you know, a very complex graph or a picture or something. You just need to see it. Um, and the last step I do as a narrator is where I try to parse the minutia of the writing to find the author's voice. Writing is like acting. It's all about choices. So the way – what I try to teach my students is there are clues – in every single paragraph about how the author feels about the topic they're discussing. They're going to give you a hint. They're going to use a word, uh, an adjective or an adverb or a catchphrase or a metaphor that you can go, oh, I see, they're really angry about this part of this topic or, oh, they're being reflective here or they're being empathetic or they're being aggressive. And it literally can change paragraph by paragraph. So the clues are all in the text. It's that old chestnut about playing Shakespeare, all the clues you need to know how to play a scene are in the text itself once you learn to see them. And so I, I look for that. I, I look for that, 
their main idea for every paragraph because I know that's the most important thing to get across. And, you know, and then I highlight, you know, any other issues that might come up that I want to discuss with the, with the author or with the publisher I'm working with. And, you know, I'm, then I'm, I'm ready to roll. Mm. And um, so I, I come other things, you know, I, I warm up every time I, before I get into the booth, I do a little yoga, a little vocal scales, all those silly actory things you learn in school, but that really do pay off in the long run. And, um, and also I think the last thing is knowing when to narrate. I mean, obviously you might have constraints with, if you have a studio at home, like I do. So, you know, when the kids were little, I couldn't narrate when they were around. They had to wait till they go to school. But all, but if you have the luxury of narrating whenever you want to, everybody has a biorhythm when you're up or down in, in, a, in a given time of day. And so what I try to teach the authors is to practice during that time so they can get the, you know, all the pistons are firing so that they can get the most out of their own practice session. But that's the biggest thing I, I try to get across to them is practice. This is like running a marathon and they've only been running sprints. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if they, if they're not, if, if it's the one thing I, I harp on when I work with authors, I'll have a session with them and I'll say, OK, I'll see you in a week and you have to read two to three hours a day out loud in your closet. Go, you know, and I, I can tell you to a man and woman, they've come back and said that piece of it beyond the scoring and learning the scoring of the text and some other technique issues to actually sitting their butt down in that little space and reading aloud and recording themselves just to listen back taught them more than anything I could teach them or anything a two minute, you know, a 15 minute session could that kind of grind is where it happens. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, yeah, it's so interesting because I feel the same way. I feel like podcasting, I, I did po professional speaking training and I've been podcasting for years and yet I still felt those initial narration sessions and still I learned so much every time. So this preparation is, I think, what definitely marks out a top level um, uh, narrative, I guess, or, or narrative per performance. Now, uh, we're, I'm, we could talk forever, but I want to move into the more business side. Oh, and sure. And sure. um, I'm fascinated by artificial intelligence. Those who listen to this podcast know that um, I, I did a show and talked about maybe AI for voice and voice synth and companies like DeepZen.io that are going to put out books that are AI narrated. Now, uh, you know, from what you've said, it seems almost impossible that a, uh, an AI could narrate in the same way as you're talking about. And yet I have heard uh, some of the samples and they seem pretty pretty amazing. Um, so what do you think about the uh, changes in technology around this? And would you ever consider licensing your own voice for an AI uh, audio narr narr narration as such? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a brand new, it's a brave new world out there with this. I uh, recently, uh, last month in New York City, we, um, uh, uh, we had a, a meeting with the, the AFTRA, which is the uh, television and radio union I'm a member of, talking about this very issue. What's going to happen with audiobooks? And um, no one really knew. You know, we were waiting to hear what the first generations are going to sound like. Uh, would it be better to license your voice? How, how, do, you, you, know, how do you contractually handle that? Um, there was discussion about what happens if somebody pirates your voice, not just your voice. Let's say that they can bind your voice, Joanna, and my voice and a third voice to create a brand new voice that doesn't sound like any of us, but it has pieces. How do we, do, you know, how do we track that down so that we're not being ripped off? Like musicians, I suppose, back in the days of, you know, when uh, downloads were being, mm. you know, people could download music for free. Um, you know, it's it, it's one of those things that eventually. I'm sure the, the 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 algorithms will get sophisticated enough to come pretty close to mimicking the human voice. And like you said, you were saying before that you know it just takes a certain number of hours uh, for the computer to pick up enough algorithm or samples of my voice to create its own unique algorithm. But I'm I'm always curious about the one thing that I don't think AI. I'm not sure if it'll ever get, which is that sense of spontaneity, that sense of chaos. Uh, that makes me want to choose this choice over that choice. You know, th I, I have no, I, I have no other point of reference. I'm interested in it, and yes, if there was a way to say license my voice for an audiobook production, 
um, uh, that I felt was contractually safe, as it were, and that the end product was of a certain quality, a certain standard, I'd be very interested to see what it, what, what it was going to do. I think that's a it's the new world we're about to jump into, whether we like it or not. And if there's one thing that I've learned as a freelancer my entire life is the only way you can stay secure as a freelancer is to always be changing. That's the only permanent thing about being a freelancer is to always be changing, always be looking for the newest opportunity. And this is it. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to be very interested to see how it plays out. I want, I'm really interested about hearing your book. Uh, <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm very interested to see how, what does it sound like, you know, and d- does it come off as being something that is sounds, you know, how natural does it sound? Are the nuances there? Yeah, and and but coming back to what we said originally, if yeah. it's about the audience, how much do they care? So if I, as a listener, am listening at two x and Audible, the Audible app now goes up to three point five x, um, and someone actually emailed me and said that they don't speed it up, but they do remove pauses. There's an app that removes pauses. <laughs> or silences in between things so that it actually does speed up the performance and so i i totally agree with you i haven't done this yet but on the yeah. coming back to piracy so i had um a big evening discussing if i if i try and license my voice if i put my voice into the ai machine whatever that may be then right. um what are the dangers and when i thought about it basically there's enough you and i both there's enough of our voice out there in the world that anyone could pirate us right now like you could do a a deep fake on either of us because there is enough of our voice data on the internet already so that's why i'm interested in in licensing because hell someone could do it anyway so why not try and capture at least a piece of potential revenue of a future market and i'm with you i mean i don't think this is we're not going to see mainstream ai audio in 2020 but i'm pretty sure 2021 um, we're going to see this. I think I think it's already starting to change. So I'm really glad you said you're open to it because I feel like um, in, unless people are open to it, it's going to uh, get quite difficult. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, it's it I, it's going to be just interesting to see how it all plays out. I, going back to that thing about pauses, though, it's funny mm. you should say that. Uh, once again, this gets back to tempo and performance. Um, I understand why they've come up with that app because. A lot of people in nonfiction – well, it's it's one of the first things I teach my students is that it is a performance. There's acting involved in nonfiction. If you, it's who are you, where are you, and who are you speaking to? It's acting 101. And if you can buy into that and develop the skill to – you know, reading aloud is, is not an easy ta- task to do, to do it at tempo. Mm-hmm. All right? You have, to, you have to learn to think faster and then read faster. And then take the information in and you actually start to read ahead of yourself ever so slightly. And it's that gap of time between when you take the information in and when you speak that you make your acting choices. But there is a sense of drive to the the narration in nonfiction, um, which is why they have those apps to take out lots of pauses. But one of the things that I, I do in my performance and that I teach is that you know, if we go with the concept that when an author writes is writing and they write a paragraph, that paragraph is a meditation on one little tiny idea, one iota. And they're going to explore that thing through the paragraph, and they're going to talk about this and that and this and that, and they finally come to the end of the paragraph. And now they're going to start the next paragraph. And it's that little beat between that we absolutely must have because all it takes is a momentary lapse And maybe you've experienced this, a momentary lapse of concentration on your part as a listener when you've got it cranked up to, say, two times speed. And suddenly you're like, oh, wait a minute. They've moved on to a new topic. And what was the topic we were at? All it takes is a momentary lapse of concentration from the listener's point of view. If there are no pauses between paragraphs, they're going to get lost. And the moment a listener goes, huh, then we failed because the sense of, you know, just throwing the information at them like a machine gun. Those little some pauses have to be earned, but they are necessary in the overall performance of a piece. Just like when you watch a movie, there has to be pauses between scenes so we can say, OK, we're done with that that scene now. Now we're going to see this new piece of action. Mm. It's a really it's a subtle technique, but it's cognitively speaking, it's important. I mean, have you experienced that as a listener? 
Yes, but I, in my mind, in I'm feeling that there's a tension between, you know, you're an actor, you're a performer. Yeah. There's the tension between your performance and you as a craftsman, and you've been mm. paid for 20 plus years as a craftsman. Yeah. Me, and as a writer, obviously, I get paid for my writing, but I'm now, I find myself as an audiobook listener, I care less about that. Um, I can use the back button, which is 30 seconds yeah. back. And I feel that there's this tension and that's where the AI comes in. I had lunch with a friend of mine who has in the last year, she's a busy mom, you know, she has a busy job and she does all her reading by audio. And she said, the biggest frustration for me is not everything is in audio. And I asked her, you know, she's just a normal person. She's not a writer or, or, or a creator or an actor. And she And I said, well, would you listen to slightly less good audio narration in order to just get it in audio say so an ai that was cheaper for example but you got it and she was like absolutely give it to me now i want it mm. now so because we're missing so much in audio i feel like normal listeners are, are, are just wanting more so but at this tension between art and business we're almost out of time so just um okay. the, the final question is about this tension between art and business which writers feel actors feel um narrators feel so your book to be or want to be which is such a mm -hmm. good um, title uh, is for actors but the principles apply to all creatives so obviously you talked about adaptation to new technologies but any other tips for escaping that starving artist uh, mindset um yeah very quickly it, it boils down to things like you know let's go from the premise that they have a day they have it there in nine to five picking the right day job is is vastly important you're going to have to keep making decisions that take you away from your comfort zone you're going to be, you know, if you, most creatives are do well in their day job because they're creative. They're, the, you know, they can they can do the job in less time. They show flair. They show initiative. And suddenly you, your boss will be saying, well, you know, we can give you some more hours and a little raise if you'll stay with us here. And suddenly those are hours that you could use writing or performing. So you have to constantly be making trade-offs away from security to give yourself time to work. Um, money management is another big issue that I found again and again with uh, with, with my students. Is they, if you don't manage your money well, it doesn't all ultimately ultimately matter what kind of day job you have. If you're always broke, you never have money to invest on the business. Um, the other thing, there's some also things like networking and and the, the ability to be charming of all things. Uh, you know, my students, a lot of people I run into, not only within the audiobook world, but generally. This is the, the notion of networking, of being on social media, going to networking events, rubbing elbows with people, both literally and figuratively, scares the daylights out of them. And like it or not, you have to learn it. I'm an introvert, but I've become an extroverted introvert because I had to be. You know, uh, that's a huge that's a huge one. And, and then l lastly, I think thinking like a CEO, this is a company. You know, it's, it's your career, Inc., and one of the biggest things that I ever did, most successful things I ever did for myself, a piece of advice I turned into something that changed everything for me, the way I looked at my career, was I thought of it, I was the boss, I was the CEO, and I had to sort of, I know it seems a bit schizophrenic, but have meetings with myself as the marketing director and the publications director and the money manager and so on. But the, the physical thing I created that made all the difference was I built myself a board of mentors, a board of directors, there are people that I check in with regularly, uh, people in marketing and business savvy, uh, you know, everything that I need to know about how to run my career. Uh, the people I pay for their time or they become friends of mine. But their advice has been absolutely invaluable because it gives me a sounding board. I'm asking marketing questions of a woman who is a marketing director. I'm talking to someone about time management who coaches other CEOs on time management. That kind of feedback is invaluable. You know, it's beyond the books you might read. And also, if nothing else, it, it makes you have the mentality of, yes, I'm taking this venture I'm doing seriously. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, so if people want to invest in themselves some more uh, by checking <laughs> your, as a nice segue there, <laughs> um, yeah. to in, for example, your, your voice coaching or anything like that, or checking out your book, where can they find you and everything you do online? Um, that would be seanprattpresents.com, um, S-E-A-N-P-R-A-T-T, presents.com. 
and it has all of the information and links to my book and the audiobook version, thank you very much, that I did, and also information about my coaching and where I'll be next as far as doing workshops and so on. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Sean. That was great. No, thank you, Joanna. I appreciate it. I hope you found the interview with Sean useful today and that you have some tips for performing your own work, whether that's live or on a podcast or radio interview or in audiobook narration. So next week, we are back on Writing Craft as the wonderful James Scott Bell will be here talking about unforgettable endings. And I always love talking to Jim. He's a fantastic writer and always has lots to share. So that will be next week. Happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.